The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Hello, everybody. So today I'm going to be speaking about the challenges of um, going from a KitchenAid mixer and creating two inch by two inch ASTM standard uh, brass molded uh, test cubes to um, 11,000 pounds up to 27,000 pound mixes. This, this video is something everybody's familiar with. Yes. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, doctor. So as you know, with this uh, area we're dividing by four, it, um, it continues on um, for quite a while. So I have several clients. I'm an independent consultant. I'm self-funded. I've been doing this over 20 years, UHP spe uh, UHPC specifically for 15 years. I've invested well over a quarter of a million dollars. Um, why? I actually I, I highly believe in this product. I think UHPC, and I have for over a decade, is definitely going to be um, a value in the future. Initially, it, it could be perceived logically as being uh, not very cost effective, but when you look at repairing a bridge every five years and spending a lot of money or replacing the bridge versus potentially encapsulating it with much less material, with something that has a very low chlorine, uh, chloride permeability, factor um, and can handle weather and everything else, things start to line up financially. So this was the initial <sighs> this was the initial this was the initial way that I was uh, testing over the years and I'm still doing it occasionally because as everybody here that's messed with UHPC knows, you can take a teaspoon of crushed quartz and replace it with zirconium and everything changes. So to be doing that on large scale was just not realistic for me. But it did, um, it did allow me to produce thousands of cubes and start to extrapolate and correlate data and create curves and graphs, then bump it up to why I'm here today. What, I, what I'm finding, and when I say I, I'm talking about many years of reading Dr. Uh, K's uh, data, Dr. Simon down at the University of Texas, Dr. Cherie, Mr. Graybell, is I've, I've found initially was to push to the point of failure. In this case, I'm putting in a 15% load, a 20% load by weight of the dry material so I can take it up to where it fails. Obviously, we're dealing with glue and aggregates. Well, in my world, there are no aggregates. In our world, there's very little aggregates. My biggest particle in, in a mix I have is um, 280 microns is the average <laughs> retained by the sieve and not very much goes above that. So I thought more and more and more, let's get so much fiber in there and the matrix is nothing but a steel wood ball with a little bit of glue. And as we all know, you can't have two physical, pro, uh, two phys physical entities occupying the same space at the same time. So then the balance became, let's, let's get the glue where we need it to hold together. The binder in my world, is, in our world, is the fiber. The fiber is huge relative to nanosilica and some of the stuff I have is very 100 micron negative mine. Uh, the numbers are outrageous. Some of the stuff is very, very fine. I have a volcanic ash from Athens, Greece that is minus 50 uh, microns. Very reactive prozolon to partially substitute for silica fume. My goal was to make this stuff affordable so when we go into large scale production, as you'll see next, it's, it's realistic with the uh, uh, chief financial officer who's writing the check or not writing the check because it's too expensive. So one way to do that was to substitute um, some of the more expensive ingredients that aren't easily, uh, easily able to be purchased in different countries with natural prozolons that are, are locally available depending on what country you're in. Now we start to 
transfer this to real world and big world. So what you're about to see is a real world, a real world application. We're taking, um, in this case, 11,000 pounds, three cubic yards, uh, utilizing a forklift to, um, to put in uh, large amounts of product. So we're just picking up the super sacks, we're cutting them, we're dropping all the product into a traditional ready mix mixer that has the 16 inch welded spiraling fins. A lot of energy, we're screwing that down uh, just to make sure that all my nano and sub nano particles are being thoroughly incorporated even though my batcher has already done that, that we're going to be adding the metal fiber. There were four challenges I found with trying to do this large production. Timing was everything. On the initial attempt, we were putting in the dry product, putting in the water, and then putting in hundreds of pounds of, of uh, metal fibers, mixing, mixing, mixing. It started to thicken up, but we had to start tempering it, and it was very, very challenging and frustrating. It got to the point where we opened up the chute, or started unscrewing it down the chute, it was so thick, guys were up on the chute with a shovel trying to push the stuff down. Now, this was a 95 degree day, everything you don't want to do, 95 degree day, the truck was 100 degrees, they were pouring in a black tent uh, environment that was 120 degrees, the rebar was everywhere and that was easily 110, 115 degrees, so everything that could go wrong went wrong. I regrouped, came back the next day, and the theory worked out uh, to my advantage. Cool the metal fibers, just don't put them out in the sun. They become almost similar to ice. A lot of surface area. I'm using a very small fire, uh, fiber. It's not a double helix, but genius design. Uh, I'm very envious and jealous. Um, but I'm using a very small fiber that's more of a crimped helix to achieve some of, the, uh, some of the aspects that my colleague was speaking of prior. Chill those fibers down, get as cold as water as you could. Well, they had 70 degree water, so that's, that's life. I couldn't change that variable. I could change the uh, mixing time, I could change the water binder ratio. My mix is all white, so it reflects heat um, for many reasons, and so the architectural world can add coloration to it. In addition to being white, I have everything in it, so just add water mix, so it's a 17% water binder ratio, very low amounts of water to begin with. So I couldn't really pull out or add anything on site with the exception of one chemical that I found. So um, the next day, we loaded the entire machine up with um, 17,000 pounds of mix. We immediately put the metal fibers in. We started churning it. Well, the energy from that truck then took the metal fibers and turned all of them into it was a 2% by volume load, a 6.66% by dry weight mix. Started acting as many mixing paddles and shearing paddles. It increased my particle packing, I found out later. Then when I added the water, they became multiple blades. And the, the break time that was crucial on a hot day that was taking, it was taking 10, 15 minutes to break, dropped down by about 40%. We didn't change any of the water or anything else. And it uh, ended up doing very well and um, the initial data is, is showing what historically it's, it's been uh, breaking at about 30,000 PSI at 70 degrees. Now in that case it was 95 degrees, but we've done it at 70. So we pick up the bags, we, um, we get them in, and then we start dumping in boxes of metal fiber. This is all what I've already mentioned. Let's get out of here. And these are the uh, fiber types. So I've been working on a, a hybrid combination, a cocktail as you, will, uh, as you would. Coming from 15 years of looking into um, alkaline, resi alkaline resistant glass fiber, as everyone probably knows here, the fibers are designed to partially fail. That's what relieves the stress. If you look at it under an electron microscope and you're putting a load on it, you'll see fibers slipping and breaking. That was always a little confusing to me because if it's repetitive stress, and you're constantly getting a percentage of failure over time, one would think that you would hit that 50% point where 50% of your fibers have failed. So I went to a, um, a, a similar approach by having three different types of fiber. So I'm taking a half inch fiber, a semi-helix, but not as cool looking as, as this company's. We're crimping it, and then we're taking a three quarter inch version, 
uh, aspect ratio is wonderful. That's why we can dump in 50 pound boxes without it birds nesting and, cre and keep the fluidity. And then I have a three quarter inch fiber that's straight. I'm going after surface area also for bonding. So everything is flat versus the uh, round uh, hypodermic needle. And they tend not to be as uh, slippery or painful to handle. So these guys are grabbing these things and throwing them in. Once I uh, injected the larger fiber, my water demand went down, right? Because we have still a 2% by volume dose of fiber of the dry mix, but the, the bigger the fiber, the less surface area uh, by weight also. So it decreases the, the weights there, but it decreases the visual amount of fiber. Uh, ergo, you can lower the water down. I was able to w lower the water down 10%, um, which bumped the compressive strengths up. So that was a fiber that took about 12 years to find a company that would work with me. Fibercon International out of Pennsylvania, God bless them, because I went to the big companies and they said, how many tons do you want? And I said, I, I, said, you know, I need 100 pounds to test, and that wasn't going to happen. But these guys worked with me, and now we're putting out quite a few thousands of pounds of it. So this is the cocktail. So you're seeing, I'm pointing as if you can see it, uh, the, the middle bottom is the half inch um, uh, fiber to the right, low carbon, to the right is the three quarter inch, up top is the three quarter inch straight. And when it's mixed in at different percentages, that's what you're seeing in that ball. And you can take this ball via box and dump it into a machine without having clumps and it equally distributes. Uh, distributes. Now this comes back to not me pitching my fiber. This comes back to why I'm here, which is talking about, and this will work with most UHPCs that I'm aware of. Being able to get this done in the real world in a very large volume, multiple cement, uh, cement trucks coming in, not having to do on plant and have high, expensive high shear mixers and extremely high labor. The goal is to make this affordable to, our, to the industry to make it more attractive for everybody in this room and the people that would potentially buy from them or uh, benefit from the, the research that you've contributed to create this stuff. This is um, adding water, and obviously it's a, it's a crucial thing. So everything's large scale. We put the product in, we put the fibers in, we bring it over, we go to a control room, and they are, they're popping this stuff in by the gallon, and it's all happening very quickly. This is 11,000 pounds, so I needed 100, and everything turns into gallons. I need 115 gallons of water to maintain everything. Um, as everybody can imagine, 5% above that, my water binder rati ratio goes out the door, and the stuff will turn into heavy cream. Uh, which it didn't. So this will only take a second. And that's, this is real time, how, how quickly they can get 115 gallons in there. I think it's 990 pounds of water. It's quite, it's a neat thing to see. So there's my 115 pounds in real time. This is the fins I was describing uh, that spiral everything in. And then we just let this baby mix. 15 minutes. Now just prior to that, and this is the one chemical I told you is beneficial, just prior to that, BASF has a, a product called Z60. It's a workability admix. It's dosed by six ounces per 100 pounds of cementitious. It'll work with all types of polycarboxylate. The uh, dumbed down version of what it does is it basically puts your super P to sleep. So super P, the second it's activated and starting, it's in the alkaline environment and is doing what it does and it's, it's um, the clock is ticking. And when you're talking about something that would take 30, 40 minutes, by the time you're uh, ready to pour uh, place, uh, the super P is almost exhausted. It starts to thicken up. So what intuitively, people start to retemper. And when I say people, I'm talking about the guys that control our industry. It's, it's not everybody in this room. It is to the degree of creating it and delivering it. But these guys, water is their friend. In our world, water is our enemy. So they want to get water in because why? It's easier to clean up, it flows faster, they have less issues. And then everything, all hell breaks loose and it starts cracking and everything else. So in this environment, I had to stop the guy from going crazy on water because intuitively that's what he wants to do. So the Z60 uh, at 6% per 100 pounds of the cementitious is for 70 to 80 degrees. At 80 to 90 degrees, you put in 7 or 8 percent. At 90, you shouldn't be out there, but if you have to, you could put in 9 or 10 percent of the cementitious. It goes in right after the, bricks make, uh, the mix breaks and becomes very fluid. And then it stalls everything for an hour. It's, it's beautiful. It eliminates uh, 
And I have no stock in BNSF. I've just suffered enough to recognize a good product. So it decreases the skinning that I'm sure everybody's familiar with, especially on a hot day, especially when you get into mixes with polymer. My, my particular one doesn't need it, but when it's in there and the sun hits it, you have saran wrap over your surface, and if you're trying to pour layer on top of layer, there's always a concern about a cold joint. So that, that really resolved a lot of the issues for me. On hot days, on a cold day, it wouldn't make a difference. This is probably my favorite video, and we're almost done. So this is uh, the challenges of UHP, uh, UHPC. The challenge we had here was you're seeing fibers flying, you're seeing stuff all over the place. What you're not seeing is lumps. What you're not going to see is balls of fiber, bird's nest, and everything else. We're unscrewing the product very slowly, A, to let the air out, and B, to sort of prime the chute. So what, what, what we've done initially, and I won't tie up with it right now, you'll find this online because I've uploaded it. What I've done is we, we prime, we get the chute out, that gets rid of any dry powder, then we reverse the direction of the motor and completely get rid of any um, powder. Because right, right on the bottom you'll see little specks of powder, but that's not lumps. And by reversing the engine and then bringing it forward, the direction of the drum, it, it eliminates that completely. So this is, again, um, it, this flows, which I'll show you next. Now after one hour, I'll show you how it flows. So we did 75 uh, four by eight cylinders, and this is approximately an hour after we've been pouring, uh, placing. And just keep a quick look, I didn't do this on purpose, but watch when I go to the left. Now what, okay. Let me go to the next one, here it is. So as I go to the left, unintentionally, you'll see a stream of this stuff being discharged. There it is there. And that's one hour into it. And that's with very low water. We came in with jackhammers to get that off the next day and it was 65 degrees. We were at um, 14,520, 14,380, and 14,510 uh, PSI, sorry for the lack of conversion on day three, so it turned out to, to be a successful pour. And then we're making all the cylinders. Big discussion about this because th that's an ASTM, ASTM lab and uh, yeah, they only test with metal fibers. And so this, this whole thing gets me very confused about the uniformity and the need for a consistency. But my mix will never, they say my mix will never be used without the fibers. So why are we doing compressive, compressive, uh, compressive breaks um, without my mix design? The way they look at it at this lab, and it, it, I'm sure it'll change within years everywhere else, they, they, it's like having a car. You're always going to have tires. So why test the car if you don't have tires on it? I have to do it this way because my clients are demanding the real world results, not the lab results of ASTM without uh, the fiber in it. And in conclusion, if anybody has any, any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So the, the first question is just make sure that I understand you correctly. So you, you mix the dry materials in the mix, in the truck first, and then edit water later. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, I had it pre-patched. So I brought in super sacks of product. We dropped them into the cement truck, dry spun it just to make sure everything was dispersed, add the dry metal fiber, well, the metal fibers, then added the water. Okay, and it, what, what was the total mixing time? Total mixing time was five minutes of dry spinning the mix, just to make sure it was, everything was incorporated. Metal fibers was six minutes, once they were in, to fully disperse. Water was added. We went until it broke, which in this case, with that much energy of a truck, took about six minutes before it broke over, versus 18 minutes without the metal fibers. Then we let it spin for 15 minutes once it broke. I'm sorry, once it broke, we put in, we put in the uh, workability ad mix. It was 2.25 gallons for 11,000 pounds. It's very strong. Then we spun for 15 minutes, then we discharged. Thank you very much for coming out here.